Welcome back to this last session of Influence and Intrigue, the role of women in Israel's history. Now, one of the curious aspects of American culture today is the fascination with the British royal family. You find endless, breathless reports about Charles and Camilla and William and Kate and Harry and Meghan, even as they have forsworn their royal status and live in this country. At the Argistan District Convention last spring, one of the pastors admitted to getting up before dawn to watch the coronation of Charles. I mean, my reaction is always, we fought a war to get rid of those people. And yet, the fascination just continues, and the obsession with all things royal goes on. Well, the further you go back in history, the more true that is. But that's due more to the fact that history only records the life stories of royalty and the nobility. Almost no common people had their life stories preserved from ancient times. And as we hear about all of those uh, royal figures, it's easy for us to forget how out of the ordinary their lives were at that time. Well, we're concluding today with the stories of three of those royal women in the Bible. As it happens, all three of them ended up being married to King David. And actually, beyond that, there are only a handful of royal women who are even named in the Bible. A couple of them, like Jezebel and Athaliah, were just wicked. I mean, just plain evil people. David's wives are about the only faithful Israelite women that are, or royal women that are named in the Bible. But we have to remember, none of them were run-of-the-mill Israelite women. They were all part of Israel's creme de la creme. The name of the first of these royal wives looks like, and is often pronounced, Michael. But in Hebrew, we read more like Michal. She's introduced in 1 Samuel 14 as the younger of King Saul's two daughters. But her story really begins only in 1 Samuel 18, where she is a pawn in King Saul's plots and plans. Saul had promised that whoever could defeat Goliath would be married to his older daughter, Merab. Well, David, of course, dispatched Goliath with his sling, but by then Saul had begun to see David as a serious rival to the throne. And so he married off Mirab to another man, which of course was a major insult to David. Meanwhile, we read that Michal had a huge crush on David, which isn't really surprising. He was kind of a rock star in his day. But that gave Paul, Saul the perfect solution. He would give Michal to David rather than Merab. But even then, Saul asked for the traditional wedding gift that a groom was expected to give his new father-in-law. And the very unusual gift that Saul asked for was 100 foreskins of Philistine men. Uh, Philistines at that time were Israel's arch enemy and fierce warriors. Almost certainly Saul expected David to die in the process of trying to gather that. But of course, naturally, David had no problem securing the bride price. In fact, there's a textual variant that says he ended up gathering 200 rather than 100. So Saul had to keep his word, and he gave Michal to be David's wife. But Saul was getting more and more afraid and jealous of David. In fact, it really seems that he was becoming more and more mentally ill. Meanwhile, David apparently saw Michal as just a consolation prize. And to be honest, from his and Saul's point of view, that's pretty much what she was. But neither one of them seemed to give the least thought to what Michal thought or wanted. 
Now, to her credit, she loved David and was loyal to him even over against her father. In 1 Samuel 19, she actually helped Dave, David escape from Saul's soldiers by creating a dummy of him in his bed and pretending he was asleep there. When Saul learned of the deception, Michal said that David had threatened her, and that's why she had to do it. That wasn't true. But that little lie helped probably to save her life for defying her father, the king. But to his discredit, David did not return Michal's love or loyalty. After escaping from Saul, he made no effort to bring her with him. And once David had abandoned her, Saul just married her off to another man. But years later, when David finally became king of Judah, he insisted on taking Michal back. Oh, now you care about the wife that you deserted. Well, actually, no. What he cared about was that Michal not have any children who would be rivals to the throne because they were grandchildren of King Saul. And that's just one hint of many that David's claim to the throne was not as secure as we maybe think it was, especially in the early days. So Saul's general, Abner, just took Michal away from her new husband. And neither one of them had any say in it. It was just a raw exercise of royal power. And it led to one of the really heartbreaking verses in the Bible. In 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 16. But her, Michal's husband, went with her, weeping as he walked behind her all the way to Baharim. Then Abner said to him, go back home. So he went back. I mean, it seems that her second husband, Palti, or Paltiel, actually loved and was committed to Michal. What a concept, right? Well, given all this, the last episode about Michal isn't surprising, but it is deeply tragic. In 2 Samuel 6, David finally brought the Ark of God into Jerusalem, which he had made his capital city, to make it both the political and religious center of Israel. And this was a tremendous religious occasion, and it appears that David celebrated uh, rather immodestly as the ark was brought in. 2 Samuel 6.16 says, Michal, daughter of Saul, looked out the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. Really, can you blame her? But when she confronted David, he didn't give an inch. 2 Samuel 6, verse 20, Michal said, Oh, how the king of Israel honored himself today, uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servant's maids, as any vulgar fellow might uncover himself. But David shot back. It was before the Lord. Who chose me in place of your father that I have danced before the Lord? I will be abased in my own eyes, but by the maids of whom you have spoken, by them I shall be held in honor. Well, Michal's rebuke gave David the reason he needed to sideline her for good. 2 Samuel 6, verse 23 says, Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. So there never were any grandchildren of Saul that David had to worry about as pretenders to the throne. But what a bitter, bitter pill for Michal to swallow. Recall we've talked several times before in this study of how vital it was for women in the ancient world to bear children. And Michal was denied that opportunity. She was basically held captive by a husband who treated her very, very badly. You know, I think Michal's story is one of the most tragic and infuriating in the whole of the Old Testament. David's next wife, Abigail, has a much less depressing account. But she too was held captive by a boorish 
jerk of a husband. His name was Nabal. And 1 Samuel 25 paints a very unflattering portrait of him. Now at the time, David and his band of merry men were on the run from King Saul. And to help provide for themselves, it appears that they were running a little protection racket. A nice little flock of sheep he got here. Shame if anything happened to them. Although, to be fair, Nabal's shepherds did say that David had protected them from raiders who were trying to steal from the flock. But when Nabal, uh, when David tried to get Nabal to pay for his services, he not only refused, but he insulted David in the process. He referred to him as a servant rebelling against his master, Saul. But David wasn't rebelling against Saul. He was running for his life from him. Plus, David was an anointed king of Israel, even though that anointing took place in secret. So David was not about to take that kind of disrespect sitting down. So he and his men prepared to raid Nabal's household with the intent of killing every male there. Well, that's when Abigail stepped. First, she gathered an enormous gift of food and supplies for David and his men. And then, without telling Nabal, she went out to meet David. She freely admitted to him that Nabal was an ill-tempered jerk and begged for David's mercy on him. In Hebrew, the name Nabal means fool. And Abigail told David he'd earned the name really well. But still, she begged David to forgive him, spare him and their whole household. Well, David was impressed. He did forgive Nabal and thanked Abigail for stepping in to stop him from conducting that murderous raid. And then he sent her back home to live in peace. And that might well have been the end of it. But very conveniently, Nabal had a severe stroke the very next day. He died 10 days later. And David declared that it was God's judgment on him for being an ill-tempered fool. But then immediately, David turned on the charm to try to woo Abigail as his wife now. As we read the text, there really wasn't much romance involved. But Abigail didn't need a lot of convincing either. It's ironic, though, that the moment that Abigail marries David, she all but disappears from the Old Testament. I mean, she's listed a couple of times as a wife of David. And it's intriguing that every time she's listed as Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel, always tied to her first husband rather than to David. I don't know if that's just to remind the reader of her background or if there was some other motive for the author always to identify her that way. In 2 Samuel 3, uh, there's this short little genealogy that says Abigail was the mother of a son named Kiliab. But his name never appears again in the Old Testament. Was he her only child? Did he die in childhood? We just know nothing else about him. So it's ironic that Abigail is portrayed very positively. She's assertive. She's a natural leader. She's a peacemaker. And that account in 1 Samuel 25 just cries out for more information about her. But it seems that the author of 1 Samuel saw her story as all about David. I suppose by this point we shouldn't be surprised by that. But it's still really disappointing not to know any more about Abigail. The third of these royal wives is likely the best known, Bathsheba. But her story, too, is an infuriating account of mistreatment. The key text here is 2 Samuel 11 and 12. And if you haven't read it recently, please do. It's just a powerful narrative beautifully written, that raises a whole range of emotions. 
It starts with King David, later in life, lusting after Bathsheba as he watches her bathe. Now, I have always read the text of 2 Samuel 11 to say pretty clearly that Bathsheba was completely innocent in this. The author says she was bathing in order to obey the law of Moses. There wasn't anything scandalous about this. Plus, David was able to see her only because he was on the roof of the palace and could see into her home next door. But I have been surprised to hear a number of scholars blame her, at least in part. I have to wonder how much of that is just to spare David's reputation. Or, I wonder how much is it because the scholars are mostly men. In any case, it's not impossible that she was a little reckless here. But I continue to think that Bathsheba is meant to be portrayed as completely innocent in this. And that is in part because David had no excuse for getting her into bed. His inquiries about her revealed that she was already married to a man named Uriah. But David didn't let that stop him. He summoned her to the palace. And you can't just say no to the king. Now, it isn't clear if Bathsheba was flattered by David's attention, or if he seduced her, or if it was simply a case of rape. But it was not proper at all, and David knew it. Worst of all, he got her pregnant. And now we are talking a scandal, big time. But rather than confess his sin and reverse direction, David went into conspiracy mode. Now, we Americans all learned from Watergate that the cover-up is always worse than the crime. And that was certainly the case here. And in fact, the part of the story that, that deals with the cover-up is told with great troubling irony. For example, Bathsheba's, Bathsheba's husband Uriah was a Hittite, not an Israelite, and yet he knew and obeyed the law of Moses better than David did. Once David learned that Uriah was a straight arrow who could not be corrupted, who had the highest integrity, he actually sent Uriah's death sentence by his own hand back to the battlefield. What contempt that showed for him. And then when the news came back to David that in fact Uriah had died on the battlefield, his smug response is just infuriating. I always want to reach out and slap him. Well, by then David thought he had totally covered up his misdeeds until 2 Samuel 12, verse 1. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. David could hide it from everybody else, but not from God. As we admit each week, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all des desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Well, then, in a great confrontation with Nathan the prophet, David finally confessed his sin. And God forgave him. But the child he had conceived with Bathsheba died as a result. But in all of that intrigue, we hear nothing from or about Bathsheba. In fact, she isn't even named throughout that. She's simply called the wife of Uriah. She was taken by a man who made her both an adulteress and a widow. And she had no power to tell David to get lost or to leave her alone. Even the child who may have brought some comfort to her in all of this trouble ended up dying. Well, I think that helps to explain the only other episode in the Old Testament where Bathsheba appears. After her first child with David died, she then gave birth to Solomon. And as David neared death, Bathsheba was determined that Solomon would succeed him. 
So in 1 Kings chapter 1, she and Nathan the prophet engineered that outcome. It appears that David was well into his dotage and maybe not fully with it by that time. So Nathan and Bathsheba tag-teamed David in saying that he had promised that the throne would go to Solomon. The problem is there is no record of David having made that promise in the Old Testament. So was it just not recorded? Or did Bathsheba and Nathan make up the whole story, just invent it? There's no way to know. But again, if Bathsheba was less than honest with David, you could hardly help but feel that he fully deserved it. And seeing Solomon take David's throne must have struck Bathsheba as a kind of poetic justice. Well, all three of these royal wives suffered at the hands of the men around them. Michal's experience was the most bitter, tragic, and infuriating. Abigail was the most assertive and independent, but her account is cut off much too soon. And Bathsheba did manage to bring a positive result of sorts out of her abject mistreatment. But in all three of these sad cases, the one thing we do know is that God worked in and through them, as well as the less than chivalrous men around them, to further his saving will. And to see God manage to do that maybe gives us hope that perhaps God can use the likes of us as well. Well, thanks for being a part of this faith group's journey. Enjoy some good conversation now in your group, and we hope to see you for the next Faith Group's Small Group Study from Faith Lutheran Church. Mm -hmm.